Does anybody want to share a quick reflection from today? Anybody want to offer some thoughts? I'm going to, I'm going to do something dramatic and change the security settings so that anybody can unmute themselves. So, Woo. so you all have the power now. <laughs> the Thelma, diversity and inclusion panel sessions were totally amazing and gave me life. Yay. Oh, Allison, thank you. Yes. Are you talking about the indigenous survivance one? Yeah, but I'm sure the next one would have been just as amazing, if not more amazing. Thelma, how about you? It was awesome. I spent all day in the Power of Community track, and it's awesome all the projects. We talk about bioelectricity and biomaterials and how fungi can be edible with biomaterials, with furniture, with everything. So really glad to be here and hope to continue this way. Amazing. Anybody else want to share a, uh, a thought, comment before we get quote started? Of, quote of a day from uh, Keone Spornet Protocol Workshop. How many biologists does it take to figure out how to use paper? Mm -hmm. Turns out quite a few. <laughs> yeah, I, think I, I spent my day in uh, diversity and inclusion, and uh, I, I think that entire track was great. A lot of great ideas on how to include different communities, especially indigenous communities in, 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 in the community biospaces and maybe even using the community biospaces as ways to engage outside of science and into activism and, and advocacy for um, change. It was great. That's so beautiful. Yeah, let's do a couple more of these. Please, please keep chiming in. Other thoughts? Yeah, anything from the education tracks or um, uh, governance tracks? I really, really loved the um, the high school panel where there was like five or six high school students all speaking to their experiences with like mentorship, like from BioCurious and from BioJam. And it was just really inspiring and cool to see that there was like that kind of support for students in high school. Um, because, you know, in my hometown, there was just like none of that ever. So it's really cool that that's happening. So it was funny, that panel was happening at the same time that Indigenous Survivance was happening. And I was in that chat, like, this is the best panel I've ever seen. And then I kept, re so I was in five Zooms at the same time. And I kept seeing when the youth panel was happening, everybody was like, this is the best session I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> it was just funny seeing like both of those things. Actually, I'm gonna share a screen guys. I, so because of my like alt host capabilities, I was able to be in five Zoom rooms at the same time. Here, I'm gonna show you guys like a little video. Can you guys see my video right now? Yes. All right. Here, this is my this is my my video of. Yay! materials or region and take that to home and be safe. And we have to shift like the way. Uh, obviously, we do experiments. We are not having any contact. But uh, for example, some of the idea. So, anyways, I was doing that for a long time, just like looking at all five things happening at the same time, and it made me so happy. So. That's amazing and overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of was. And um, I think those adjectives are maybe the best way for us to launch into our closing session for this evening. Okay. So um, if you guys all can still hear me, which it seems like you can, um, actually, I think we're going to dive right into it. So just a little funny thing. Um, I was having a little sidebar with Drew just to, just to prep, prep uh, going into this. And we had this email exchange where he was like, oh, how much time do I have? And I was like, well, you could go for like 15 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, and then we can do like a discussion and then we'll do like reflections with the group. And I think Drew misheard me somehow and has prepared a two hour talk. Um, but uh, he's going to figure out how to do the two hour talk in one hour. <laughs> I really don't know how you mistranslated my 15 minutes into two hours, but I love that you did. I think that's, you know, monumentous. And, um, and yeah, and like I said, the, the open mic starts at eight. So, you know, it can always bleed into the open mic, Drew. This is, you know, as you can see, like Biosummit gets loopier and loopier as the day goes on. So we're kind of in, we're kind of in the loopy part of the day. So you've joined us at exactly the right time. So. Thanks for, thanks for bringing me here, David, with everybody else. And um, <laughs> how about, how about this? I mean, what if, what if I um, try and push about 30? I, I have, um, a wish. The, the, the last 10 slides are a, um, an essay by Ursula Le Guin, where I've just block, cut, and paste the text. And when we get to that, 
it's such an amazing tool of liberation, I think, that I'd, I'd like to ask if people might volunteer to read a different snippet of text as we click through the slides. So that's how I'd like to end. Um, Sounds brilliant. Okay. Sounds so brilliant. I'm going to share screen. Would that be okay? Yes. And as you're doing that, because we always do this with everybody. Okay. And now that we're doing, now that we have liberated you all and we're making the unmute function a thing, let's all unmute ourselves and actually make some noise for Drew Endy as he gets into his talk, everybody. Let's make some noise for Drew, y'all. You guys can Woo! unmute yourselves. Liberation. Yes. Woo! Muted. Woo! Unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you guys are the best, and it's it's. I should acknowledge there's so many um, wonderful old friends and colleagues here, in addition to mostly new people. Um, I guess it started with a bioeconomy prompt, but really, what got built was about tribes, and dreams, and technology and community. Can you see that and and hear me? We yeah, can. we have some we have some sneak attacks coming in too. Oh, I love it. Um, We've got all kinds so, of sneak attacks happening. So I'm um, I'm participating from what's called today San Juan Hill in Stanford, California. And um, before then it was the lands of the Olami and then um, the subgroup, the Rematush, as I've learned. And that that sub name refers to people from the West. Hey, Max, Max and Sam, you got an option. You either join and you're gonna help me give this talk with some awesome people, or you're gonna be a little bit quiet. <laughs> so, so I wanted to acknowledge the people that came before, but also return immediately to the present. This is, this is a pretty classic moment right now, everyone. I think Biology. this is relatable to anybody who is parenting during COVID or in general. <laughs> uh, I love it. Thank you. Um, so how about today where I live? What are the tribes of the San Francisco Peninsula today and how might that inform your themes of, of the summit? Um, so here's an amazing photograph from about a month ago. It's um, taken from the Stanford golf course and it's looking back on campus. And this is the largest tower on campus, the Hoover Tower, home of the Hoover Institution. You can see it's being struck by a lightning bolt as if Zeus is smiting um, the land and literally blew the top off the tower uh, with that lightning bolt. So really incredible photo. And at the Hoover Institution, there's a new director. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, and a really neat interview with Condi um, about how she's thinking about things, taking the helm of this institute. Why'd you decide to do it, um, she's asked. And um, she's not happy about the current state of America and the world, and there's challenges piling up and got to do something about it. And challenges to the governance of free people suggest that we need good answers to the problems we're facing. And um, a policy center based on the notion of free people, free markets, prosperity and peace are being sought all the way back to the wishes of President Hoover and so on. Um, the next, next exchange. Um, want to explore the issue of, quote, late stage capitalism. I'm using this phrase, she says, to challenge us to be provocative in our thinking about how the core of what's ailing us, the greatest economic system that's ever existed, um, if people are incentivized by labor to smartly mobilize resources and capital, all of society will be better off. I believe in free markets and so on and so forth. I'll just click ahead. However, she says, I recognize that those who don't believe in that are making some serious charges where capitalism is failing. If our answer is that we're actually growing the economy, then they will say, what about all the people who are left out? By the way, this is the tribe of the free market, the tribe of the free, okay? Um, what should be our answer to the following? Um, we accept and so on. So we don't get angry if Yo-Yo Ma, the musician, makes more money playing the cello. We don't get angry if LeBron James makes more money playing basketball. Huh. What should we do? Um, how should we address the politics of jealousy? Now, this is an interesting tribe. It's related to another tribe in the region I inhabit, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, when we think about, she's not, she's right, by the way, in terms of, of economic growth. Um, 
um, compound growth of money. Um, here's one of my favorite economic essays from Keynes, one of the top British economists of the 20th century. He published this, this in 1930. Gosh, that's 90 years ago. And of course, that's the Depression, the Great Depression. And um, it's actually a really interesting essay because he says, look, you know, this depression thing, it's a little attack of economic pessimism. Um, but he goes on to say that basically the, the structural transformations undergoing economic growth um, are so robust that he's very confident that there'll be year on year compound economic growth for as long as he can imagine, at least 100 years. And so he runs the numbers. He does the mathematical estimation of how much economic growth there'll be from 1930 to 2030. And we're almost done. And he comes to the conclusion, at least from my reading, that there'll be so much money by the time his grandkids are alive, nobody will have to worry about money. That's us. Here we are, right? No, something went sideways. It turns out what didn't go sideways was economic growth. He underestimated the economic growth. Huh. Now we see curves like this, these exponential curves, not just in the economy, but in some of the tools, including the tools that shape biology and biotechnology. So Moore's law for computing, faster and faster computers, better and better reading of DNA, sequencers, better and better writing of DNA, synthesizers. Um, what stories do we tell? What tribes exist around these narratives? This is the tribe of the exponential, um, uh, okay? that's complementing the tribe of the free market. And some of the stories and interpretations and narratives are captured in books like this. The singularity is near. Humans will soon transcend biology, bio, info, nanotech, all coming together. And now what's interesting about this tribe of the exponential is it doesn't really, well, kind of, geez, uh, it's an abdication. It's an abdication about the future, except that it's coming faster and faster and faster. Um, so questions are typically not posed. Um, will this be a fair future? Will I find meaning in this future? Will I be a citizen in this future or not? And by not asking those questions, well, you're not gonna answer them. And it means that the levers that might be levered or buttons that might be pushed along the way never even exist to be levered or pushed. Um, okay. So, What's missing then if you only have the free market as a tool, if you only have the exponential as a ramp into the unknown? What's missing is a destination. So let's reflect a little bit about how people um, architect destinations. Martin Luther King here before Washington, one of his well most well-known speeches, maybe you remember the name of his speech. I have a plan. Nope, that wasn't it. I have a blockchain. Nope, that was not the name of his speech. I have a free market. Nope. I have a bioeconomy. Nope. None of these things were the name of his speech. We all know his speech was called I Have a Dream. And a dream is a way of organizing people. A dream is a way of enabling people to work together um, that complements the tool. Uh, that's a star in the sky um, by which people might motivate the usefulness of a free market or the tools or the other things. And so I just want to try and flag very plainly, I feel that I'm inheriting a land that's dominated by the tribes of the tool, if you will, whether it's the free market or the exponential, and there's an abdication, there's a missing spot in the culture regarding our common shared um, destination. Uh, dreams turn out to be incredibly powerful, and so I just want to elaborate a little bit on um, two modes of dreams. Everybody knows this, but if you're thinking about it from a, a community and governance perspective, it's probably good to be reminded. Um, nightmares are one type of dream, and they surround us. And, and the thing about a negative dream, I'll call it that instead of a nightmare, is if you're using a negative dream, dream to cause people to organize, um, it basically means the bad thing has to start to happen before you'll get people doing stuff. Um, the best example in the United States is when Baltimore caught on fire about 100 years ago, and the fire trucks came from the neighboring cities, Philadelphia and Washington, 
to go to help put out the fire. But when they got to Baltimore, they couldn't connect the hoses to the hydrants because the United States had never agreed upon a standard for fire hydrant hoses. Oops, the whole city burns down. Now that was such a nightmare that it motivated people to standardize fire hydrants and hoses. All right, so that's an easy example. This is an example that might upset some people. The narrative around climate change, I would submit for consideration, is a negative narrative. It is a nightmare narrative. It is the thing we don't want to happen. And an implicit consequence of framing it as a negative dream is that it has to start evermore to be true in order to get action. Um, now, what would be the positive opposite of climate change? Uh, climate awesome. Hey, everybody, let's work on climate awesome. That'd be cool. That, in fact, wouldn't be cool, it'd be awesome. Let's make climate awesome come true. And, and suddenly, it sounds funny. Doesn't it sound so funny? Because we've all grown up in this negative nightmare frame of the narrative of the dream of climate change. Um, and people are so religious about their adoption of that label now, I get yelled at when I talk. Anyway, okay. Um, Positive dreams can enable collective action before reality appears. Um, a moonshot, uh, 10 years of work. Um, now the actual Apollo program is both positive and reactive to other things like the Soviets, but there's a massive positive uh, pull uh, bringing people to do work together before the reality manifests. Begs the question, biosummiters, do we have a dream? <laughs> Do we have a dream we hold in common that's a positive dream about biology, about our relationship to the living world? Or do we only have negative nightmares? Um, we definitely have negative nightmares, and I'll come to that, and you've heard about it, and you'll get more on it, I understand, regarding biodiversity and conservation. Um, I think this is a profound and fundamental question for all of us, and together, right? So on the left are just some facts I'm not trying to litigate. Uh, things about biology that really advantage us, that make it meaningful to join together in this community. The place that needs careful attention, wrestling matches of thinking and advocacy and doing is what goes on the right, which is my attempt to give an example, not a prescription, but an example of what an answer could be to do we have a dream we share in common regarding biology, enable humanity to provision for 10 billion people, do it without trashing the place, take infectious disease off the table. Gosh, let's make COVID-19 and everything that comes afterwards obsolete. Yep, that sounds good. Uh, culture of citizenship, understanding life by building. Again, example, not prescription, but needs attention, answering this question. Okay, I'm gonna, um, switch gears in a couple different points to give some uh, just totally different ways of thinking about this. And, and so at this point, I'm going to uh, run through this exercise. Technology is not technology. Let's see what I mean by that. And the reason I'm going through this exercise is I wish for you to think about the technology you develop to make the bio dream you might wish for true. Um, so this is not a pipe. You might have seen this painting. I don't really mean it in the way that Magritte did. Um, I mean it more like this. A computer is not a computer. So here's a computer. It's an industrial computer. All right. Here's a computer. It's a personal computer. The difference in the computer has very little to do with invention or innovation in the physics of transistors. It has to do with who can compute where on what for what purpose. And the personal computer doesn't replace the industrial computer, but it complements it. And because it changes how humans can relate to computing, that's where the revolution comes from, right? It's cultural revolution enabled by um, forming technology in a particular way. Closer to our topics here, a DNA sequencer um, is not a DNA sequencer. It depends on the DNA sequencer is all I'm trying to point out. Um, a yeast that brews a medicine that might be optimized for an industrial fermenter that's 100,000 liters is not a yeast strain that brews a medicine that might work for somebody in a rural village that is not provisioned by Western supply chains. If the promise of biotechnology is to enable the making of things anywhere, yet the context or environments or niches by which capital or labor is structured to optimize the biology are only optimizing for industrial niches, well, guess what we'll have? We'll have only industrial 
biotechnology from a content side. Technology then, to repeat, is not technology. And here's a different fun example that elaborates on some of the consequences of this point of view. This photo from of order 100 or so years ago is um, one of the uh, uh, representations of how the practice of painting changed over time. Painters used to mix their own paints all the time, but then eventually you got standard paints in standard packets, like a standard biological part almost. Um, and as a result, it had an impact on who could practice painting, what the community of painting was. And why did that matter? Well, who's painting what where? Suddenly you see people painting, not just in a studio, but literally on the beach, as you can tell, because there's apparently grains of sand in this canvas. Um, yep, look at that. If you change where painting occurs, you change who's being painted. And by changing who's being painted, it's not just the patrons of the arts with their portraits appearing, it might be the workers in the fields being represented for time, for us to appreciate. The practice then is a representation of a reality. And if the practice cannot reach the reality, that reality cannot be represented for community. Note that this is all linking back to the form of the technology instantiated, the painting too. Representation then underlies meaning making and culture. Um, impressionism, uh, painting in nature, representing diverse groups. To zoom back out, the technology that gets developed depends on how people are organized to develop the technology. One of the things I'm most excited about and curious about for the community convened here is how does this community impact this observation? How does this community shape and form and demand and incentivize the forging of a particular form of biotechnology. In other words, whose biotechnology? Whose biotechnology are we gonna get? And how will that relate to who's developing the tools for the biotechnology? It's amazing how the word decomposes, by the way. Biotechnology. I want to highlight some um, extrinsic variables that may inform how you choose to ponder that prompt just from the previous slide. This is a photograph, obviously, of um, photovoltaic solar panels for generating electricity. And usually, if you think about these things as an individual consumer, um, you might think about how much money the electricity is worth that the panels make. But I want you to really nerd out for a moment and think not about money. I want you to think about joules, J-O-U-L-E-S. How much energy does it take to make the panel? And how much energy does the panel make? And what's my return on energy? Do I ever get my joules back? And what's really interesting about photovoltaic over the last decade is the effective return on energy, which is highlighted down towards the bottom in that peach color, has gone above one and is now averaging around 20 for the industry. What does that number mean? It means a, a, a solar panel, after a year of operation, will um, generate the electricity that is sufficient to make the panel. That means that um, we're transitioning to an electricity generation abundant civilization. That's never been true before, ever. Huh. What does that mean? What does that mean for biology? Well, first off, I'm gonna acknowledge it's really hard to think about what it means to be an energy generation abundant civilization. So I'll give you a, a postcard to, to tease your mind. Um, imagine it never snowed or rained anywhere ever again. And we had to implement an artificial freshwater system for the entire landmass of the earth. Well, that's just gonna cost energy, right? Because the freshwater systems evaporation from solar panel and power in nature so how much energy would it be if you took state-of-the-art reverse osmosis and pumping uh, costs for, say, an elevation of 1,000 meters on average? And when I do the math, it looks like it would cost about 20 terawatts of energy to run an artificial freshwater cycle. 20 terawatts of energy is about how much energy civilization now uses. Stated differently, 
if we doubled energy generation for humanity, we could run an artificial freshwater system. We have to do that anyway, based on the projections that are coming. We have to double the energy budget. It's really interesting. It's not like 10 times more energy or 100 times more energy. It's just like double it. Um, huh. So it's really, I'm just, this is trying to be like really hard to think about what it means to be power generation abundant. Uh, how about back to biology? Maybe you've seen this, maybe not. This is one of the most remarkable things I've stumbled across in the last year. Um, on the left is maybe one to two decade old findings where you can take electricity, you can split water in the presence of carbon dioxide from the air, fix that to make a single carbon molecule formate. All right, so you can go from electricity to formate a carbon molecule. And what's filled in in the last year or so through genetic engineering is microorganisms have been engineered to grow on formate instead of glucose. You put these two postcards together, a kilowatt hour of electricity, and thanks Keone for your help with the napkin math long ago, kilowatt hour of electricity looks like maybe you could get to a gram of biomass. And from talking with the chemical engineers who handle the left, they think they can push the efficiency up about 30 fold. So maybe we could get to 30 grams of biomass from 10 cents of electricity. Oh, and by the way, we're going to electricity generation abundant. What this means practically is the cap on what you can biosynthesize is no longer the 90 terawatts of natural photosynthesis. It's however much electricity we can generate, wherever we can generate the electricity. That is amazing. It suggests we could make a box that looks like this, the PB, the personal biosynthesizer. It takes in electricity, that power will be used to take from air, nitrogen and carbon and water. Um, we're gonna have to figure out how to do recycling on the other elements needed for life. Into that box is gonna come biocode, that's through the internet. And what comes out of the box is whatever biology you can make. Um, and so we're gonna have the PB if we want it, and we're gonna have the bionet that transitions industrial society with a complement that, that um, competes with designing California made in China to design anywhere, grow anywhere. Huh, none of this is true right now to be Captain Obvious, but it's meant to illustrate the puzzle of who's biotechnology. What will the tooling look like? Who will be able to practice biotechnology where for what purpose? The answers to this question will shape community and culture. Um, I'll cherry pick one snippet from Tom Jefferson about citizenship to link it back to that. What he's writing here is how if you have access to land, you're unlikely to be oppressed politically. Now in his time, it's the early 19th century and his framing is limited to property holding white men. So it has all those problems. But the abstracted political lesson is in early 19th century, if you have access to fertile land, you just go there and you're gonna be free. And if you don't, you're at risk of being oppressed. To abstract that still further, what he's arguing is that the option of accessing the means of production, the means of having an existence, is the ultimate defense against political oppression. It is the fundamental ballast of being a citizen in society, as opposed to a consumer, a subject, or an object. Um, so now if you think about who's biotechnology, I would submit for consideration, I wish for everybody to have the option of learning to read and write DNA, of learning to practice biomaking. It's not that everybody's gonna do it, but everybody might need to have that option in order to be a citizen of a 21st century bio anything. Why is that incredibly cool in addition to just seeming like uh, necessary for democracy and a liberal democracy at that? Um, I wanna share a little vignette um, from a conversation I had with Donna Haraway um, at UC Santa Cruz. Amazing, amazing person. And, and this conversation actually drew upon an interaction with Alejandrino, a vanilla farmer from Mexico, who taught me about vanilla farming. Um, what I had heard about vanilla farming and so on was mostly that industrial brewing was gonna make natural vanilla in a fermenter. And that was gonna be great, because it's gonna be natural. And then I heard about people who weren't happy about that because it would impact the livelihoods of people like Alejandrino. Um, but when I listened to, to him, I learned something very different. He taught me about the practice of actually farming vanilla in the forest, how the flower um, opens for a week or two. It has to be pollinated manually. It takes nine months for the bean to mature. The beans are harvested and dried in common in the town plaza and then brought to market. Um, 
And as he was telling me all of this, I realized I had no idea how I could do anything of relevance to what he cared about. Um, and once I admitted I was totally ignorant, I could listen more carefully and imagine what might be possible, but it was really for him to tell me. Maybe I could change the morphology of the flower such that the cultural stories told about man and woman and gestation and so on um, could have new plot lines in the culture of farming vanilla. Maybe I could make a little puff of beautiful odor appear at the right level of water content when the beans were dry to reinforce community and culture in the town plaza, uh, the making of meaning as opposed to the making of molecules. And if I just opened up my mind a little bit, the possibilities of what 21st century biotechnologies might do if gifted to somebody else to do whatever they wish with it would be very different than what I might imagine in, in my um, uh, peninsula living dominated by the tribe of the free market and the tribe of the exponential. So it's so critically important, it seems to me, to get the puzzle of whose biotechnology resolved in a way that gives optionality and undergird citizenship and liberal democracy. So I'm gonna wrap up real soon and transition to this reading. And so I'm gonna be looking for about 10 volunteers to come off mute and read. But as I'm closing out, I just want to um, give an example of, of, of how I parse MLK, I have a dream and all these sorts of puzzles. And I'm going to offer a replacement for the tribe of the exponential. I now submit for consideration the tribe of the whoop de doo We're gonna go up and over this hump. Not that long ago, humans were organized in regimes of scarcity where energy and knowledge and stuff, jewels, bits and atoms was all very limiting and not regularly supplied. It really isn't that long ago um, that Paris as a map looked like that. This century, we're gonna land in a new basin of attraction, a new dynamic steady state as a culture and civilization. It's the dream. Uh, Jules Pitts and Adams will be provisioned in abundance and they'll be provisioned via resilient and robust networks. The question is how to get there from here. And the reason that's a question is because the cultural, political, and economic systems that we've inherited and are operating are adapted to maintain stability and growth under regimes of scarcity. So they're not well adapted for a regime of abundance. And so it's gonna be a very interesting transition. Evidence that we're heading this way is that the return on energy for energy generation has gone greater than one. That's actually already checked. We're already past that whoop de doo peak. Design anywhere, grow, build anywhere. That's the PB in the Bionet, not, not in existence, at least a decade out if we all somehow figured out how to organize resources and worked really hard. But if we saw that PB start to show up, right, then I'd say, huh, okay, we're heading that way too. And that's relevant because it's gonna be the biology that handles the stuff, the matter, the atoms that civilization needs. And then we gotta have everybody with the optionality around this. And I would say practically, one in a hundred people actually have to be literate, especially with respect to 21st century biotech. So I have a dream, it's over here on the right, and it's the dream of the whoop de doo and the dream of a flourishing abundance-based civilization that enables 10 billion people to live on this planet without causing harm to the others. So with that, um, Let's do this exercise. I'll give a little bit of a preface and then we're gonna go right into it. And I'll read off the first paragraph and so on. So this exercise is naming and unnaming. And I mean it as a, um, a, a gift of liberation, so to th say, uh, such that you might um, think in uh, interesting ways uh, for the rest of the summit. And, and underneath this for me is, um, what are we taught to forget? Or what do we actively forget? And, and then as a compliment to that question, what should we forget? I'll skip this over just to get to the discussion. So it turns out we're really good at naming things, um, trying to understand our place in the universe, um, keeping track of things. Uh, we love naming things in nature, especially all the other living things, right? Um, 
the forms of nature and so on, describing them, keeping track of them, keeping track of them as they go away forever, as they go extinct. So let's try this instead. Um, Ursula's essay is, uh, what, uh, 35 years old now, and um, I find it amazing. So I'll start, and then whoever would like, I'll just advance the slide, and if you can read the screen, would love to hear um, Ursula's words in your voice. Drew, before you begin? Yes. Should we pick volunteers? Because I think if we pause, they should we, should we pick in advance who's going to do it, or do you want to just let it flow? I follow your lead. You tell me. Can we get some volunteers? Okay, we've got Desiree. Who else? Drop a plus one in the chat if you wanna if you wanna participate in this exercise. Okay, it looks like we've got we've got plenty of folks. Okay, and David, could you do me the favor of of calling the next person? Yes, I will call the next person. I'm just gonna do it in the order that they're appearing in the chat. Okay. Um, most of them accepted, okay, there's a, so the name of this is, the name of this essay is She Unnames Them. And if you're listening, uh, among other things, you could wonder about who the protagonist is, who the she is. Um, I'll start. Most of them accepted namelessness with the perfect indifference with which they had so long accepted and ignored their names. Whales and dolphins, seals and sea otters consented with particular grace and alacrity, sliding into anonymity as into their element. What's happening here is the species are no longer being known as, as species. Um, uh, the Bill the goat is just Bill, no longer Bill the goat, if you see what I mean. Um, okay. A faction of yaks, however, protested. They said that yak sounded right, and that almost everyone who knew they existed called them that. Unlike the ubiquitous creatures such as rats and fleas who had been called by hundreds of thousands of different names since Babel, the yaks could truly say, they said that they had a name. I can't see. They discussed the matter all summer. Next. Hello, Issa, and let's just go okay. in order. You don't know who's next. The councils of the elderly females finally agreed that the thought the name might be useful to others. It was so redundant from the yak point of view that they took it themselves and hence might as well dispense with it. After they presented the argument in this light to their boss, a full consensus was delayed only by the onset of severe ear early blizzards. Soon after the beginning of the thaw, their agreement was reached and the designation yak was returned to the donor. Kiani. Um, among the domestic animals, a few horses had cared what anybody called them since the failure of Dean Swift's attempt to name them from their own vocabulary. Cattle, sheep, swine, asses, mules, and goats along with chickens, geese, and turkeys, all agreed enthusiastically to give their names back to the people to whom, as they put it, they belonged. Eugene. A couple of problems did come up with pets. The cats, of course, steadfastly denied ever having had any other name other than those given unspoken ineffably personal names, which as the poet named Eliot said, they spend long hours daily contemplating, though none of the contemplators has ever admitted that what they contemplate is their names, and some onlookers have wondered if the object of that meditative gaze might not in fact be the perfect or platonic mouse. In any case, it is a moot point now. It was with the dogs and with some parrots, lovebirds, ravens, and minas that the trouble arose. These verbally talented individuals insisted that their names were important to them and flatly refused to take part to part with them. But as soon as they understood. <clears throat> that issue was precisely one of individual choice and that anybody who wanted to be called Rover or Fru Fru or Polly or even Birdie in the personal sense 
was perfectly free to do so. Not one of them had the least objection to partnering with the lowercase or as regards German creatures, uppercase, generic appellations, poodle, parrot, dog, bird, and all the Linnaean qualifiers that had trailed along behind them for 200 years, like the tin cans tied to a tail. The insects parted with their names in vast clouds and swarms of ephemeral symbols, syllables buzzing and stinging and humming and flitting and crawling and tunneling away. As for the fish of the sea, their names dispersed from them in silence throughout the oceans like faint dark blurs of cuttlefish ink and drifted off on the currents without a trace. No one were left now to un uh, a name, and yet how close I felt to them when I saw one of them swim or fly or trot or crawl across my way or over my skin or stalk me in the night or go along beside me for a while in the day. They seemed far closer than when their names had stood between myself and them like a clear barrier, so close that my fear of them and their fear of me became one uh, same fear. And the attraction that many of us felt, the desire to smell one, uh, one another's smells, feel or rub or caress one another's scale or skin or feathers or fur, taste one another's blood or flesh, keep one another warm, that attraction was now all one with the fear. And the hunter could not be told from the hunted, nor the eater from the food. This was more or less the effect I had been after. It was somewhat more powerful than I had anticipated, but I could not now in all conscience, make an exception for myself. I resolutely put anxiety away, went to Adam and said, you and your father lent me this, gave it to me actually. It's been really useful, but it doesn't exactly seem to fit very well lately. But thanks very much. It's really been very useful. It is hard to give back a gift without sounding peevish or ungrateful and I did not want to leave him with that impression of me. He was not paying much attention as it happened and said only, put it down over there, okay? And went, went, went on with what he was doing. One of my reasons for doing what I did was that talk was getting us nowhere, but all the same, I felt a little let down. I had been prepared to defend my decision. And I thought that perhaps when he did notice, he might be upset and want to talk. I put some things away and fiddled around a little, but he continued to do what he was doing and to take no notice of anything else. At last I said, well, goodbye, dear. I hope the garden key turns up. He was fitting parts together and said, without looking around, okay, fine, dear, when's dinner? I'm not sure, I said. I'm going now with the I hesitated and finally said, with them, you know, and went, out, went on out. In fact, I had only just then realized how hard it would have been to explain myself. I could not chatter away as I used to do, taking it all for granted. My words now must be as low, as new, as single, as tentative as the steps I took going down the path away from the house, between the dark branches Tall dancer motionless against the winter shine. Ursula Le Guin. Guys, that was magic. That was really magic.
And now I was going to break the silence right there. Um, can we give some snaps for Drew? Can we give some love for that moment that we all shared together? Yeah, you can unmute yourselves if you like. That was, um, wow, that was really, really special, everyone. I kind of don't know where to go from here. That was that was that was really amazing. That was really really amazing. Drew, how do you feel? Happy. <laughs> um, so everybody, um, we have another fifteen minutes here nominally before the open mic. Um, Drew, do you want to hang out and we can chat a little bit more? I also feel like you set such an amazing vibe right there. Um, I, I feel, I feel, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like just kind of basking in that moment for a bit, but um, we do have 15 minutes. So we could take a, take a little bit more of a discussion if you guys would like. Does anybody have a comment or a question or, or something, or an offering, a sharing? Um, can I say something? Of course, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you so much, Drew, for your talk. Uh, it's extremely important for us that we are on the science meet uh, and, and the science things uh, to detach from the contexts. Oh, from the sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, from the concepts, because once one defines something. Every, every, every time that you see something new, you get back to that same concept and you keep like uh, seeing the world as the same always. And that is a gigantic problem for us that we're developing technologies and all of that. So I also send in the chat, uh, if anyone wants to discuss further about philosophy of difference and biotech, uh, I would love to about Spinoza, Stengers, Deleuze, Guattari, Bergson, because uh, the discussion of philosophy in this context of biotech is so important. We have a great responsibility in our hands and we must be thinking about these things, about uh, not uh, going to the universal things, to the concepts, to define this world that purely is different. So I've been studying for so long about philosophy and not finding the, the, the reverberance between my biotech fellows, colleagues from the university, because I see maybe, uh, sometimes people are always so uh, closed in concepts that they can't see like the world as pure difference. And I think that that is, is essential for us to reach this point of the the great constructions, the good constructions that you drew set to us all here. So I thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> That's so spot on. Th thank you for that reflection. Mm -hmm. um, I want to share one little thing that um, was a real magical uh, uh, experience earlier in the day for me. I was talking with um, a good friend and colleague, David Graywall from the law school at Berkeley. And um, he was reflecting on um, economy and, and bio, bioeconomy um, and the limitation of that framing. Um, so I just want to share it in a particular way. Um, if you talk about like scaling the bioeconomy or growing the bioeconomy, you inherit this mindset of, yeah, it's going to grow 3% this year or 5% next year or 2% or 10%. And, and it's this very incremental, relentless, quantitative thing. Um, now imagine if you were having that conversation in 1980 and you were talking about the information economy. We're gonna grow the information economy. It's the year 1980, it's gonna grow. It's gonna grow 5%, 2%, 8%. But you could do that, but if you adopt that framing, which by the way, is the framing be adopted by the, bio, by the US for bioeconomy today and the rest of, rest of the industrial world. If you adopt that framing, well, you miss like, I don't know, the internet and the web, you miss the complete remaking of how knowledge and information are being restructured in civilization, right? And, and so now let's talk about biology. 
right? If we grow the bioeconomy, well, what we're going to get is incremental quantitative growth, I guess. Um, we'll have a bunch of fancy 21st century biofermenters in the United States in all the flyover states. There'll be like low wage jobs maintaining them. And that, that's like the default path. It's really kind of obvious. But, but if you said, no, 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 no. Like what we're actually doing here is we're understanding the fundamental unit of life, the cell, well enough to partner with it to build whatever cells can build, uh, then suddenly we've just completely remade civilization's capacity to handle atoms. Um, and, and it's not about incremental quantitative growth in an economic sense. It's about a structural transformation with qualitative differences and here we are, <laughs> right? So, so that, that feels much more genuine to me. It also feels like a reminder of why I got into this to begin with in the first place 20 years ago. Um, so I really, really like your, your reflection and, and, and thoughts. I'm totally with you. And wanted to just give that gift from um, Dave Graywall uh, in response to your comments. Do you pronounce your first name Haloisa? How do you say that? It's Eloisa. It's kind of true. Eloisa, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, Drew. Uh, <laughs> so why don't we do um, two more questions in closing? Um, Craig, you want to go first and then Carolyn? Yeah, I guess, Drew, one, thank you for giving such an incredible talk. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the big thing is kind of in the economy tomorrow with biology and unleashing the kind of people have been going after the bioeconomy because the promise of exponential growth, right? In a limitless world. But I think it's the, the factor if we can shift people, how, how best can we shift people to that abundance mindset from the scarcity mindset? Because it's something that's so ingrained into pedagogies and kind of philosophies of our world. Because that's really the dream. All this technology, if we figure all these details out, how do we shift over to that abundance mindset? This, this is the group that's doing it. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know the answer, but it's, it's an active, it has to be an active shift. It has, to, it has to be a shift. I think, I think Condoleezza Rice is correct about certain things around opportunity. Um, and it, it has to be, you know, related to that. The, the only additional clue I'd offer Craig in response is um, from one of my old professors, um, Rick Matthews and his old professor, McPherson um, out of Toronto. It's, um, are people consumers or are people doers? And, and to the extent that you can enable people as doers, as opposed to only being consumers, right, then, then I think that unlocks a lot of possibility. Um, the, the reason I was attempting to relate what little I understand about the structure of the narrative as it relates to dreams is because I believe that to be one of the most um, powerful tools. Right for unlocking that, but it's not it's not enough to just hang the star in the sky. It's then got to be connected to the activities right that let people join in and do. This is Indiana, by the way. Hello, Indy. You might as well properly introduce yourself now. Yeah, see, it's like all the kids and the dogs. They get shy when they get called out, but normally he gets very jealous of Zoom. So he's very jealous of all of you. <laughs> um. Wonderful. Uh, Drew, just a quick, I guess, like, just question building on this point really quickly. I mean, this, this whole notion of kind of abundance, I mean, isn't part of the problem that we've gotten ourselves into? I mean, wasn't the earth already abundant? Like, didn't we already have abundance? Like, why do we need, like, is it, if, like, I think about this in the context of like my, my, my phone, like, I always get the most memory, like, I'll, I'll have like 128, like, gigabytes or whatever, and then I get 200, like, I never, I always use it. So it's like, even if we figured out how to get more, unless we have some fundamental shift in our own values and our own kind of underlying structure, even if we just get more energy, wouldn't we just figure out how to consume more of it and still, um, you know, still continue along that trajectory? You're right. If, if what it means to be human is to be a consumer, because right. consumption is infinite. And so right. there's no such thing as abundance in a context where an actor within the system is an infinite consumer. Right. right. So, exactly. so yeah. it goes back to Craig's comment in a way, it's quite a puzzle. Um, and, and as Nell is pointing out, right, um, we, we have been forged 
over almost two centuries now as consumers, right? So we've grown up with that, at least some of us have, right? But, but maybe there are some other ways. Carolyn, go for it. Hey, Drew, thank you so much for, for that speech. That was really beautiful. And I am remembering other um, plenary speeches I've heard you make in the past. Um, and, and this time, I think you were talking about this analogy of naming and unnaming and losing a given identity in order to gain a new identity, which is really beautiful. Um, I can remember you speaking at one of the first Biohack the Planet conferences and talking about how we don't have a roadmap in synthetic biology. And one of the discussions that sprang forth was that, in fact, in arts, we do to have this process of envisioning possible futures. And that really sets a precedent for how to discover a roadmap, perhaps, in, in synthetic biology. But I have to say, many times when I hear you speak, I have very mixed reactions to what you say. And in this case, I do have a mixed reaction to this, um, uh, this idea of negative dreaming and, and whether that's useful or not. And I think we get very close to uh, you know, a Donald Trump kind of scenario when we throw out the possibility of ne negative dreaming. And I'm just, I'm thinking about this. I always think a lot about what you say. But I, I'm trying to think about when we're doing possible envisioning of futures, do we have to limit ourselves to positive or constructive dreaming? Or is there a link between the history of the past in terms of how we envision the future even as a warning sign? Yeah, Carolyn, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for, for um, your plain comment. I guess what I would admit to is, um, you know, this is a talk for you. Um, I don't get a lot of opportunity to explore these topics. And um, so I take your question seriously and will admit from the beginning, it's forcing me to think in new ways. So I tend to be a naive optimist as a person. Right, and so I'm very attracted to orienting and organizing around the positive dream. Um, but one of the things I take from your comments is, well, the history is the history, at least as it's told, and um, the negative things are are negative, and they're there, and and they're powerful, right? And and so, if if one's um, wishes involve organizing a community, right, which is, which is a proxy, I can change those words and say, well, what's, what's a community? Well, one of the things a community is, is if you organize a community, you're organizing labor. Um, you're also getting other things from community too, but it's, it's sort of like, well, what, what are the ends of community? Um, not, that, not that they're not renewing, but, but you know, to what, what is the purpose? Um, When I think about roadmaps since that talk, I guess it would have been in Oakland. Um, right. One of the things I've learned since then, Carolyn, is um, it's one thing to have a map of all the roads, but that's not the only thing I wish for. I, I, I also wish to know where I wanna go so that I know how to use that roadmap towards something in addition to the roadmap itself. And um, one of the things I've observed both starting with my own practice, but then much more broadly, is how people, at least in the synthetic biology space, tend to become occupied with road mapping and mapping it all out without really wrestling with the, to what end? Uh, what's the dream? And, and that the absence of, of, of tackling those complementary problems, which I guess was my main point in that part of my remarks, was to make sure, especially in the case of biology, where our dreams are big enough. Um, because it feels to me they're, they're mostly really tiny still, even at the level of nations, even at the level of the, the, all of the earth. Um, the human side of the bio dream seems very tiny to me still. Um, in any case, I really, I'm really grateful for your comment. It's gonna force me to think a little bit more about how I represent nightmares. Yeah.
Well, I, I will think quite a bit more too. I think it was beautiful what you said. Thank you very much. So everyone, we've got um, a minute left in this segment and we've been doing such a great job of staying on time um, for this entire Biosummit so far today. So what I'd like to do, if it's all right, is um, offer just a closing for today before we shift into the open mic. Um, and Drew, if you can hang out just for a couple more minutes, I think that would be, be great to, help, to have you stay for the wrap up here. Um, we started this morning today with LaDonna and with um, Michaela from Sierra Leone. And you know, I think LaDonna spoke really beautifully about togetherness and about speaking together and working together. Um, she talked about power and authority and not being wanted to, not wanting to subject herself to existing systems and structures. We heard from Marshall who talked about relations and structure and how do we ultimately build things new together, but also that so much of the magic of building new things depends on relations and our ability to connect and work with each other. We did a little bit of that in the context of our governance exercise, which I thought was really beautiful. This afternoon, we learned a lot. I only got a tiny segment of, I think, what we was shared today, and I'm sure um, you all, although I did get the five Zoom rooms at once, so I maybe had a little bit of an advantage. Um, but I heard a lot about um, indigenous perspectives, thinking about different ways that we can learn from traditions that have figured out harmoniously how to live with the earth for thousands of years, um, being able to figure out how to harmonize our modern biotechnologies with um, traditions that have figured some things out that we've maybe lost or forgotten. I've heard about um, people building new amazing technologies and new really accessible open technologies that could enable this type of broad diverse participation that hopefully could help create new types of structures for us to imagine a new future. And part of what I hear from Drew, and I'm gonna emphasize the line that he, I think, posed for us to think more about, which was that this line around technology that gets developed depends on how the people that are organized to develop that technology. So part of what inspires me about all of you and what we are all trying to do, I think, together in some ways is to try to figure out a new system, a new way to do science, a new way to develop technologies that is not the way we've done it before because so much of what, and the, man, the manner in which we've done things before have created so many problems and so many challenges. And so I think today, I think has been a wonderful step for us to embark on this continued journey together, which we've been on for years, but we take another step today. And let us continue over the next two days to continue that imagining that visioning of what is possible, these possible, these possible positive dreams, and also these possible ways for us to reconstruct our relations with each other as we build new technologies and as we envision a new kind of science. So that's my offering to you all of a brief synthesis of what I heard today. And you all are amazing and beautiful. And Drew, um, could we give one more just snaps and applause for Drew Endy for just giving us so much love um, somebody take a screenshot of this right now because this is really beautiful. Actually, let's do a family photo together with Drew. Can we all do this? If you guys all have an object, this is my thing. I've got my Totoro here. Um, if you guys all have a thing, we're going to do this again tomorrow after, the, our, after our plenary, but grab a, grab a good object that you feel like captures your feelings in this moment right now, whatever that might be. Um, I'm going to turn my background off so that you all can properly see Totoro over here because he's been rocking out with his, uh, with his Biosummit swag. Oh yes, oh yes. All right, y'all, we're in it. Get your object. Oh, this is so epic. This is so epic. I hope everybody's getting some screenshots of this. I'm trying to as well. Oh my God, this is beautiful. You all are amazing. <laughs> okay, everybody. Um, day one of Biosummit. Um, that was incredible. We have a crazy day tomorrow. Uh, we kick off, actually, um, Organizers, don't let me forget if there's any critical logistical things I need to mention right now, but um, the things that I have on my list for everybody to remember, there's another workshop that is starting right now, Metafluidics. If you want to learn about open source metafluid microfluidics, it's happening right now in the mitochondria. There are Zoom backgrounds in your participant drive. If you guys want cool Zoom backgrounds, go to the website, go to the participant drive. You can find them there. If somebody is able to drop a link into the uh, chat right now, um, one of the organizers, if you, could, if you guys could do that then um, folks can go and uh, grab those if you like. A reminder about the governance exercise, biosummit.live backslash governance. Please participate in that. The Mingler rooms there are open. 
The Mingler Social Room is also open 24 hours a day, so go join in that. And stay on Slack. We are all on Slack. Continue the conversations. You, the, I haven't even been able to check it because today's been so crazy, but um, there's so much activity on there, so please go and join it. Um, organizers, am I make, missing anything else? There's Other announcements? early morning workshops tomorrow morning. Yes. What time? Uh, think... They are at, well, at, they're, they're on the list. They're on the Slack. They start at 6 and 7 a.m. Eastern. But for Europe, it's perfect. And for Asia, I think it's pretty reasonable. So um, anything else, organizers, that I'm forgetting? Yeah, we're having an organizer meeting for the next few minutes in Ribosome. And I need time to get a drink and do the organizer meeting. So we will start the open mic in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Five minutes. Five minutes. Anyway, I, have, oh, go I, have Go I have an announcement. Even yeah. if you can't make the, um, the panel tomorrow uh, in the bioethics and biosafety track, please look in the Slack for the links to the biosafety handbook. This handbook belongs to the whole community. So even if you can't make it tomorrow, even if you're a different time zone than the morning plenary where they're gonna introduce it, please take a look at the biosafety handbook, make comments, make suggestions, take it home with you. It's for you, it's in the Slack. Please look at it. Beautiful. All right, anybody Any have some music to share, David? Or are you, am I gonna subject you to my horrible playlist? Walk no, us out, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Any other announcements before we go? Because we're going to close it out. Anybody else? If not, then um, Maria's going to play some jams for five minutes. But we have the open mic starting in five minutes. So hang out here. Go get a drink. Go grab your, your tasty beverage. And then I think we've got some pretty global stuff that's going to happen very soon. So hang out. And we will be back. Maria, DJ Maria, bust some jams.